My name is Norm Eisenstein, and I'm a neuropsychologist. And I work at the VA hospital up at Lyons, New Jersey. And I've worked up at the VA. Come on in. And I've worked at the VA hospital up at Lyons, New Jersey for uh, a bit more than 25 years now. <coughs> and um, what I do up at the VA hospital is um, I see people who have mental health issues which is not really so relevant to what uh, I hope we would talk about today. But uh, neuropsychologists are psychologists who have specialized in studying how the brain works and a variety of uh, neurological kinds of conditions and how this all interacts with a particular person. So uh, I see folks these days who have um, uh, Alzheimer's disease or think they have Alzheimer's disease and I see an awful lot of those folks. I see folks who have head injuries because uh, I see veterans up there and uh, uh, we have an enormous amount of concern in this country at the moment about people having head injuries coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and other adventures that the country uh, embarks on. I see people with brain tumors. I see people with multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease and a whole variety of things like that. So uh, that's what I do up at the VA hospital. But I think that uh, the group also asked me to talk here today also because uh, my son died two years ago th this month of uh, a pilocytic astrocytoma. And I have some of his MRI films here and one of the things that uh, the people organizing this conference thought would be interesting would be if I would uh, share some of my uh, thoughts and experiences uh, about that. So uh, that's also something I'm prepared to talk about today. Now, like the other speakers that you've already heard this morning, I am enamored with hearing myself talk. Uh, almost anybody who does this sort of thing likes to hear themselves drone on and on. But I'm really much more comfortable if this is more of a discussion. And I'm really not just paying lip service to that. And I'd really like this to be much more of a discussion than me just standing up here and talking. And to that end, I really don't have an enormous amount of material to present. I only have, I think, nine or ten slides that I put together. And I really hope that we, uh, uh, we talk much more, that everyone else talks as much or more than I talk. So anytime anyone has something that they want to say, this is a small enough room, you know, just uh, say it, raise your hand, do whatever it is you want, but let's have this be more of a discussion. So the first thing I wanted to say something about is what is, a neuro what is neuropsychology? And as I said, neuropsychologists go to graduate school and get a, a doctorate in psychology, but also spend time taking courses in neurology, often do postdoctoral training or pre-doctoral training uh, in a department of neurology and learn about these other kinds of uh, uh, things. Now, interestingly, if you go back before about 1950 or 1960, neuropsychology and neuropsychological testing was the only way that anyone was able to diagnose brain tumors because all of this fancy imaging that we have today really did not exist. And it was really, I think, in the early 60s that uh, computerized axial tomography uh, took place and people could actually have x-rays of the brain. And before that, what they used to do is they used to inject dye into the blood vessels in the head and try to see whether the pattern of the blood vessels looked the way it should be. Or they would inject air into the ventricles, which sounds really sort of horrid to me, but this is what they used to do. And they used to do something called a pneumoencephalogram. And what they could do with that is they could get some kind of outline of what the outside of the brain looked like uh, because they were able to introduce air in there. And when they introduced air in there and took an x-ray of somebody's head, the air was less dense and it looked uh, uh, darker in color. And you could get some idea of what the outside of somebody's head looked like. So the only way that uh, people were able to say, well, you know, this particular person may have some kind of lesion in their parietal lobe, or this person may have some lesion in their temporal lobe, was through a lot of very careful testing. And unfortunately, like a lot of advances in uh, the healthcare field as a whole, 
a lot of the advances were driven by uh, wars. And as we went in, this, in the last century from World War I to World War II, to the Korean War, to the current wars, uh, you have people who have head injuries, who are shot in the head. And as we start to study these people, and as medical care got better and more of these people started to survive, uh, there were more people to study. And a lot of the very well-known people in the area of neuropsychology and behavioral neurology uh, really made their, their start and made enormous advances by studying people who had been wounded and, and had head injuries. And from that came this idea that, well, you know, we could test people and we could find out how this works, how that works, what works well, what doesn't work well, and get some idea of whether you had some kind of lesion in your brain, whether it was a tumor or something else. Now, <coughs> since then, we've got all of this fancy imaging. We've got CT scans. We've got... Um, which is, an act, which is an x-ray that's put together by a computer so that you get a three-dimensional picture of what the inside of someone's head or any other organ looks like. We have MRI uh, images which are made by uh, magnetizing the body and then looking at the energy that comes off the water in the cells and you get even more detailed pictures with that. And we have all kinds of scans uh, some of which we understand better than others exactly what they mean, but we've got lots of ways to take pictures of people's heads now. So the things that neuropsychologists initially did really have somewhat less meaning. Neuropsychologists then moved into, um, and, and you know, it's really unfortunate how, like a lot of things, this is driven by misfortune in some ways. Uh, neuropsychologists then move into the area of head injury, which was driven by all the car accidents and all the rehab programs, and that uh, produced another spurt in knowledge and that kind of thing. Uh, and that is still going on, and it is still something that a lot of, there is a physician's assistant, and she said to me like a day or two or three later, she said, he sounds to me like he has a brain tumor, which did not occur to me, all right? <coughs> now, Nick's tumor is in the center of the front part of his head here. This is a line here that shows what the level of the slice is. Uh, the MRI takes slices at various levels. And where this tumor is affects the optic chiasm. Now, let me see if I can find, okay. <coughs> The way the pathways go for seeing things is they go from the eye, they go back to this thing here which is the optic chiasm, they split in half, they go back to something called the, um, the lateral genicul geniculate nucleus and then they go, ba go back to the occipital lobe, to the visual cortex, to Brodmann's area. And the reason I show this is because uh, Nick had worked, before he went up to, um, to Pittsfield, he worked for Parker's Nursery and he used to travel around and he used to install plants for the holidays. And he started having car accidents and lost the job. And the car accidents that he started to have were, as I, as I look back on it now, were people coming from the right side and hitting him or him hitting people on the right side. And I remember particularly um, one year he came and he said, uh, when he was still living with us, that he came and he said, uh, you know, a deer ran into the side of the car, on the right side of the car again. Now, when Nick was diagnosed as having the brain tumor when he was stable, it turned out that he had two things. He had what is called a neglect, which meant that he did not pay much attention to this side of the world visually, and he had a decrease in visual acuity overall because the tumor was sitting right underneath this area or on top of this area here. Um, 
you know, maybe this was an indication in hindsight of something that the tumor was doing two or three or four years before. But, you know, I, I did not know any of that. So um, the tumor was diagnosed at Somerset. The people at Somerset said that they could not uh, operate on him there. And they um, said, you know, to go and see this uh, fellow named Sen at uh, um, St. Roosevelt um, in the city. And uh, within like a couple of days, because you get propelled along by these events without having much of a chance to make, uh, to think about it or to make decisions. And he was really at a point where he would not have survived very long if someone had not at least done something to reduce the pressure in his head. Uh, Dr. Sen sended some uh, really miraculous surgery. And after that, Nick was able to uh, uh, go back to work. He worked at Home Depot um, and really do almost everything that he was able to do before, or most of the things that he was able to do before, except for drive. Mm -hmm. And that was because of the field loss? That was because of the visual field, because of the loss of the visual field and this neglect, this inability to attend to this part of space mm -hmm. over here. No. Because remember, I got here when Landolfi was still talking, mm -hmm. and everybody says, location, 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 location. And it's all about location, because if you have the same tumor, and you have it, say, um, in the right temporal lobe, you can probably take most of it out, and you would uh, really need somebody like me to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's wrong. If the tumor turns out to be, uh, well, at a higher level, say in the right frontal lobe, you'd, you, can, you can really take a tumor there out and really be hard pressed to see that there's anything wrong there. So it's really, it's location, 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 location. You know, and then, um, you know, I'm not the neurosurgeon, and I wish I had, uh, I wish I had the original film. The original tumor is, is, is much bigger, or, or at least you can visualize it in much bigger. And the original tumor goes from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain and encompasses uh, the circulation in the brain as well. <coughs> so I would suspect that uh, uh, the surgeon really gave a lot of careful consideration to uh, how much of the tumor to take out and how much is the minimum amount of disability that would be left with them. No, not at this point. Yes, John. Um, my tumor is in the right temporal area, my mm -hmm. brain. And uh, I had a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. He did all the MRIs. And he said that um, the tumor was near some optic nerves. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. And uh, don't know what to expect. And he also said that I might lose the use of my lose the use of my left arm, mm -hmm. um, which didn't happen. But I don't have coordination. Mm -hmm. But what did happen as I lost, I call it seventy five percent of my peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. But the only peripheral vision I have is on the right. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything down in this quadrant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can read, yes. Um, went to a, um, a, a neuro-ophthalmologist that I did the surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, surgery was at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. and, um, but he gave me all kinds of field vision tests and he determined that mm -hmm. peripheral vision loss. Um, but he's, I was tested many times with my glasses, with my glasses, Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Really. I could do it. Yeah. The, no, I was just listening to you about the, the, the nerves where they go throughout the brain. Mm -hmm. So 
if he said, my surgeon said it was on the optic nerves, mm -hmm. it was on in the right temporal area, mm -hmm. where would that be? Probably here. In that area. Probably here or this pathway that's going back to the visual cortex. Okay. And you're talking about seizures. I mean, I found the way mine was found, mm -hmm. we were on vacation in California. Um, drove from, from San Diego to Oceanside. It was about a 40 minute drive, and I drove. Mm -hmm. Got to the store. Didn't feel good in the store. Came out and collapsed into a brain mass seizure. Mm -hmm. I think I think seizures can probably arise from damage to any part of the brain. Um, let's see. This is I mean this is a picture of the brain. I'm sure you've all seen these things. Uh, this is uh, a motor area. This is a sensory area behind it here that's that's not colored. This area here controls all of our movements. There are fibers that go from this area down into the center part of the brain and then cross from one side to the other. So that when you see someone who has a stroke on the right side of the brain, if they're going to have weakness, they're going to end up having weakness on the left side of their body and vice versa. So somebody can have a seizure, which is abnormal electrical activity, with lesions almost any place in the, in the brain. And they can have different kinds of seizures. Is there something really interesting to me when you went up to the meeting at school? And the room was really sort of interesting. Yeah. Is there a localized to a part of the, part of the brain that <coughs> kind of ability to keep things going? Yeah. I don't know. You know, he, I mean, I mean he, was, he was working up there. I mean, his room was not great. You know, when he lived with his family, I, I mean, it, it just, uh, um, I don't know. It, it's, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Excuse me, one, um, my sister just had the surgery for the uh, frontal lobe, meaning the arm. I'm just uh -huh. the words. But um, what you were just asking about, my sister all her life has been extremely organized. Every year you can find an accordion file. Every month her bills, everything. Um, she moved back home with us uh, two years ago. She lost her job. Um, she's actually a physician. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I found out after she went in the hospital, I went to look for her insurance documents. And uh, when you walk in her room, the room looks meticulous until you open things. Uh -huh. And we've right. never, my mother never, we're adults, but yeah. even when we were kids, she never went in. Um, my sister's turned into some um, amazing hoarder. Mm -hmm. But it's hoarder, a hoarder of junk. Uh -huh. um, there's a giant uh, thing of, of envelopes that were rubber banded uh -huh. and protected. And uh -huh. when I open them up, every single envelope is, a, is an empty used business envelope with no documents anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm trying to figure that mm -hmm. out. But one of the reasons I came to this session is, um, I mean, she just got out of the hospital yesterday. We're mm -hmm. trying to find out about her follow-up care. Um, she's got a frontal lobe. She had mm -hmm. a six point three tumor that they said went from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. um, but we also found out she had had she's been delusional. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the delusions is is that since February she's been working as a medical researcher in Philadelphia. And it's a very very elaborate intricate delusion. Um, and right before her surgery and the days before, they gave her her phone and her laptop, and she's having conversations with colleagues and emailing, and, and there's nobody. Mm -hmm. I, I spent a week researching, and there's no one. Yeah. Um, and so we're very concerned now. I mean, it's, the neurosurgeons are like, yay, our job's done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's all out. She'll be yeah. fine. Uh, and I'm at, we were at a hospital that apparently doesn't have neuro oncologists and neuropsychologists. Yeah. And I'm just finding out like in the last day that that might be it may be better for me for her to And the surgery that. was when? A week ago yesterday. Oh, I would I would not get upset. I would wait a while. Okay. 
I would really wait, wait quite a while because, uh, you know, you're, you're messing around with somebody's brain in there. You know, the surgeon figures everything's fine. I, I would wait a while. Okay. I mean, I, I want, maybe I should make it at this point, I, I should make two points. First of all, uh, you know, I was talking about the visual problems that in retrospect Nick may, be, may have had before the tumor was diagnosed and certainly had afterwards. And what happens, and I know that this happens to me as I have gotten older, my hearing is not as good as it was before. And you stop listening to those things. Mm -hmm. Particularly when you get a high frequency hearing loss, it garbles certain sounds of speech. And before you even know it, you don't even hear them. And, and you adapt to this so quickly. And um, my eyesight is certainly not as good as it was when I was in my 20s. And, you know, as, I, as I'm driving along and I'm trying to think, you know, should I have been able to see the sign that far away? Do I need to go get my eyes checked again? We get used to all of these sensory things. You know, vision, touch, taste, smell, all of these little sensory changes we adapt to over time. So it can be very difficult to see what the changes really are. The second thing that I, that I want to say is that um, in spite of the fact that we like to predict what's going to happen with everybody's brain, it is an enormously remarkable thing. So I have seen people and I've tested people who've been shot in the head, who shot themselves in the head, and I can find nothing wrong with them. And then I see people who have fallen and hit their head on a day like today and it becomes a catastrophe. And it's very hard to predict what somebody's outcome is going to be. Yes? Would you say also that it's hard to predict from a given point what developmentally will happen on down the road and how much the brain is able to repair itself and make or compensate for areas that can't be repaired? That's been the question for the last hundred years. That uh, there are people who argue on one hand that the brain is very plastic and compensates, and then there are people who say that it is not so plastic and it doesn't compensate. The latest uh, bit of information about that is the, stu is the stuff that was published in Nature last week, and I think it was picked up um, by, the, by, the, uh, uh, by the regular press, and there was also an article. Actually, someone gave me two of these um, National Geographics about how plastic the brains of teenagers may be and how they're different. And this has been... You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. When I used to work in head trauma rehab and people would say, um, how is my husband, father, daughter, son going to be? Uh, and I would say to them, they're going to get a lot better than you think, but they may not get as well as you would like them to. I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know how to foster that. You could get a Nobel Prize if you... If you if you understood this stuff, this stuff, <coughs> stuff is just so variable. I mean, uh, the argument for it is really sort of fascinating. You know, there are people, there are children who have intractable epilepsy. And what they do is they do this really radical surgery. They do it at Johns Hopkins, and they probably do it in New York as well, maybe at the hospital for, for special surgery, where they take these kids and they, they literally remove, I don't have a picture of the brain looking from down on top, they literally remove half the brain. They remove half of the cortex out of somebody's brain. And you would think that these kids would be catastrophically disabled, and they're not somehow. They have some motor problems, but uh, their speech functions end up being someplace else. And I don't know that anybody understands that one either. I wish I could give you a better answer. Um, okay, my sister, she realized she had the tumor because she had a seizure. And mm -hmm. we took her to, you know, the local hospital in Newark, uh, mm -hmm. I think she ordered. And they said, that, you know, it's a tumor, we're not touching it because we can paralyze you. Mm -hmm. So I assume it was somewhere in the motor 
Or, or some of the paths going farther down, yeah. Uh, okay, so then, okay, so then that happens. But this neuropsychologist, I'm starting, like, you know, whatever she's going through now, whether it was the radiation chemo or now chemo again, and just the, the, the adjustment to all this, mm -hmm. you know, has to have some psychological effects mm -hmm. on her. You know, it, you know, compounded by the tumor that's there, that, you know, and you go, okay. So I, I don't want to confuse the, the motor skills that she lost in her left leg. Yeah. From the tumor, you know, it's touching on something. But then, at what point, like your sister, my sister's a, a, an intelligent woman, you know, teaching medicine, do all that other stuff. But what about at what point do you say, listen, she, she's not? Do you need a psychologist? To, do, do you bring them to a psychologist or something? I mean, you, you have to be your own advocate, you know, for yeah. sure, and seek whatever. That's a great question. That's a really great question. I think that um, I think that first of all, and, and this is you know goes along with what I was saying before, is everybody's tumor or everybody's head injury is in your own head with your own personality. And the effects that it causes are based on some interaction of these factors, some kind of subtle and unique interaction of these factors. So for example, when I looked at the CT scan the first night in the emergency room at Somerset, I knew that this was not a treatable tumor. And we said to Nick, what do you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to go back to work? Do you want to do this? Do you want to travel? Do you want to go to Africa? What do you want to do? He wanted to go back to work. Someone else might have one of these TV movie epiphanies and decide, you know, I don't want to spend my time doing this. I want to um, um, do charitable works or I want to go to Alaska or I don't want to do this or do I want to do that. Everybody's different, and the effects that the tumor has, or the head injury, or whatever it is, is going to be different depending on somebody's personality. Now, when do you take someone to a psychologist, or when do you take someone to a neuropsychologist? Well, when you have someone and you want to understand better how all these factors fit together, <laughs> and why it is that this person is depressed, or not depressed, or uh, whatever's going on with them, where you want to understand that, or the person wants to understand that better. You take somebody to see a neuropsychologist. Uh, if somebody wants to know, what can I still do? Should I go back to school? Should I go back to work? Should I go back to work at something related, but maybe is not as demanding? Uh, what kind of help might I need? What kind of assistance might I, might I want to have? Um, I just gotta say for myself, I did see there's nothing like trying it. <laughs> they tell like I mean people told me I was gonna be able to see, you know, I couldn't see large areas of the world or that I was I mean it was you can learn to compensate for so mm -hmm. much and you try it and then there's some things you just can't compensate for it and then you know mm -hmm. I can't do that. But uh, I think you can't I think you can't find the answer from somebody else. But some, <laughs> but some people it. find it helpful to have someone help them understand what's going on with them. Sure. You know, there's, there's hopefully there's some, uh, some special knowledge that maybe a neuropsychologist has or someone else has. They may be able to, you know, explain something about why. You know, this is going on on this side of your head and the left side of your body is, is not working well or something like that. It's not that. just your imagination. That it's, you know, that it's, that it's not just your imagination and that sort of thing. So, so that's a reason that somebody might want to go see uh, a neuropsychologist. I have a two-part question, but I just want to briefly say that um, having had a neuropsych exam several years after I arranged my surgery, it was a very validating experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here's some of the changes that have taken place that just having an objective report that says they've been examined mm -hmm. and these are some coping techniques that they've obviously mm -hmm. already integrated. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, first of all, just as a general principle, if you have a um, time frame that you suggest for treatment as an option, well, I know you said it was too soon for the conscious sister, but if you have a, a time frame that suggests that somebody have an, an initial you know, neuropsych exam, and also as a follow up, um, what type of strategies might people be able to do at home as some kind of cognitive therapy? Okay. I think that you're going to know, I think that you're going to know, or, or, or your family is going to know, or, or you're going to know about your family member, uh, when you should have some testing, when you have some questions. When are things stable? You know, when, when have all the acute effects of being treated gotten to some sort of plateau here? Um, I, think it, it, I think it depends on everybody. Um, I mean, it probably depends on, on, on the kind of tumor. Um, it depends on when you're, when you're, you know, sort of medically stable and, and things are, uh, are, not, are not getting better or, or things are at least are, are at some kind of plateau. It probably makes some sense. Now, what are the kinds of things that you can do to compensate? Um, and I just had another thought fly in my head. I want to come back to... Uh, um, something about frontal lobes in a minute um, and, and the particular kinds of problems that people may have there. Uh, what are some of the kinds of things that you can do to compensate for? Well, you know, there's certainly the speech therapy. There is, um, for people with head injuries, there are a great number of uh, uh, devices nowadays that people use to um, to help them compensate for the injury. And unfortunately, I don't know uh, that many of them have gotten into the brain tumor area. So for people that I see at the hospital who have head injuries, for veterans, we give them things like uh, PDAs. I don't know if we do that anymore. I think the PDAs are like passe already. We give them electronic devices to keep notes on. You know, this particularly works well when you have uh, you know, men and women in their 20s, they're all used to doing anything on the phone anyway. Uh, we give people GPS devices. You know, typically with people, if people have uh, uh, impairments in the right temporal lobe and the right parietal lobe, one of the things that often happens is they get lost and they can't place themselves in space properly. And maybe for some people, their ability to recognize familiar surroundings goes and you can give someone a GPS. You know, you can teach someone to use a GPS. You can, for example, if you have someone who's got a, a tumor or damage in the right side of the brain and they cannot uh, uh, recognize familiar places and recognize familiar people, which is also something that sometimes happens, you can teach them to do that with the other side of the brain. You can teach them to make a list and say that uh, this man here is uh, of this uh, height and his hair is this color and he usually wears glasses and that's how I'm going to remember who John is and you can people teach people to verbally mediate those things. Yeah. So to add to that, sir, that question, uh, there's a website that we found that uh, was recommended to us and we get from my mom's called uh, Mimosity. Mm -hmm. And they do all sorts of uh, you know, brain therapy, you know, puzzles and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So before there was some highway, some neuro, you know, neuron highway mm -hmm. connecting point A to point B in your brain. Uh, remember? Yeah, mm -hmm. now it's under construction. Mm -hmm. So now the brain's got to remap mm -hmm. or find an alternate or a, a detour. Yeah. And it, with, with a, enough use, you know, repetition, that pathway will build up. And then so now I'm going point A to point B uh, is much, you know, it's slowly the speed mm -hmm. uh, improves and memory improves. And yeah. But I think I'll um, sure it's uh, L U M O S I T Y, and I, what I would do if you're going to try it is sign up for the two week trial, it's free, and then cancel it, and then they'll send you an email. And be like, 
Mm-hmm. For the whole year, it's like 60 bucks or something with a discount. You know, there's always a, a balancing act between trying to help someone retrain these functions that may not work as well and helping <coughs> someone compensate for these functions. And when you see people with a head injury, you usually try to help them uh, retrain and relearn these functions for a while, for six eight, nine months or so, and then you sort of move into trying to help them compensate for these functions and give them devices that they're going to be able to use instead. And I think that uh, the jury is sort of out as to how exactly how well, and this is the question you asked about the plasticity. You know, it depends how hard somebody's willing to work. It depends how much frustration tolerance somebody has. It depends what their expectations are. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of the younger veterans that I see really are used to the video games and the devices and the gizmos and that kind of thing. We give people, um, I forgot the name of it, these $200 pens, these live scribe pens or something uh -huh. like that, where the pen, if you use it with a special piece of paper, uh, it records it, it's got a, a USB uh, port in it that you plug it into the computer, it will record what you write if you use this particular paper with dots on it. It will do optical character recognition on this. And I think it's, it's like $150 or $200. I have never used one. I have people uh, who the occupational therapists have had using these. And I've got uh, uh, people who are in school who think that these things are great. Yeah? Just amazing. I wasn't sure where I was going to go when I came in here. I saw you were a psychologist. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I'm looking at your picture up there, uh -huh. the sort of parietal lobe, and I was reminded that my tumor was in the parietal lobe. Mm -hmm. And the, the neurologist says that that brain surgery taking that tumor out is a brain injury. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, get, I get lost on my neighborhood now. Mm -hmm. 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And somebody said that um, the parietal lobe is like a map of the world to the brain, is that? Yeah, it seems to have something to do with, uh, among other things, identifying where we are in space. Okay. Uh, recognizing people, um, recognizing what's familiar and what's not familiar. I mean, one of the things, and, and I really haven't looked into this other than sort of anecdotally, is that um, if I look at myself and my wife about how we navigate, she looks for familiar landmarks, and I look for road signs and street numbers and things like that. And I don't know if that difference between men and women is so unique to us, and I think that there are different cognitive styles for men and women. But what that tells you is that uh, if she looks for landmarks and she's looking for this tree and that dip in the road and something looking familiar to her, that if she had a tumor or she had a brain injury, excuse me, probably to the right side of her head, she might not be able to do that any longer. But you could teach her to still do this by using the other side of her head and looking at uh, lists and writing directions down and following that kind of thing. So you can teach people to compensate in those kinds of ways. And then, you know, the easiest way to teach people to compensate for something like that is to get them a $100 GPS or a smartphone. And, you know, if you are of um, uh, the inclination and in some ways the generation, because my little kids, you just give these th things to them and they figure them out, who's willing to use these gizmos, the gizmos can be really helpful. I mean, Sure. You were saying. I mean, my experience was, I, I work with a, like one of these smartphones, mm -hmm. now, and I did it originally to compensate because I was just getting lost all the time. I couldn't mm -hmm. get out the door because couldn't organize all the things I needed to do to get out the door with my glasses and my phone and everything. And by having you know the phone helped me with some of those things, like I could just record. Oh, I've got to remember to do something. With the compensation allowed me to actually have some success. And then 
it was therapeutic. I wasn't like two or three constantly. Minutes. Two or three lost minutes. Lost. I was. I just lost. started. Yeah. Getting things and spending my day in frustration. Yeah. And and just having the compensation actually improved my. Mm -hmm. I could put the phone away and I could still get through the day now. Or I couldn't do that before. Mm -hmm. And just I think having some success and maybe mm -hmm. you make it easier and you learn how to do it again successfully. I mean, I just found there was a, a real overlap between compensation and actual therapeutic benefit. Like you, you don't learn anything when you're just beating your head against the wall. Mm -hmm. And but when you're having some success and you found a way to get through the day, then sometimes you don't you need as many props the next day. And it's my experience. Yeah. 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 Now, now on the other hand, I can do gizmos and I'm computer literate and all of this stuff, but I don't particularly enjoy it. I mean, I just sort of wanted to do what I wanted to do at this point. I, I don't have the inclination anymore to spend the hours figuring it out. So I might not react the same way that you did yeah, you to it. I mean, I. Uh, um, for years, I wrote appointments on, on little pieces of paper. And it's only like in this last year that I started keeping them on, uh, you know, an outlook on my computer at work and, uh, you know, keeping track of things that way. So, you know, it, it depends on the particular person. I do want to say something about uh, frontal lobes. And one of the things that happens when people have, uh, have head injuries to the front part of the brain and perhaps to all parts of the brain is they lose something that uh, a neurologist at the turn of the last century called the abstract attitude. And it can become hard for people to categorize things. So you take someone to the supermarket who has this problem, and rather organizing the produce in their head or on a list, and the meat, and the cold cuts, and the detergents, and you know the dairy products, uh, they'll go for mile to place and back and forth and have an inability to do this efficiently. People who have these problems with abstraction, and this can often be the case with people with problems with the frontal lobe, lose their sense of lose lose the ability to take someone else's position and understand what someone else is feeling and lose the ability to understand the emotional tone in words. So you might say to someone, if, if I say to my little kids, for example, I want the room cleaned up now, versus I want the room cleaned up now, that there is some emotional meaning conveyed in the difference in tone. And that can be something that goes. And that can be catastrophic for people. And this is another thing that it's good to go maybe go see a, a neuropsychologist or someone who's going to explain this to people and you know, help somebody understand this. Because all of a sudden, um, and I've had the experience in therapy groups to say, well, how do you feel about what he just said? And people uh, look at me like I'm speaking some other language because it makes absolutely no sense to them. And those things can be very difficult in relationships. And I mean, I've got lots of other examples of all of that uh, that we could talk about. Sure. What else? I mean, before Stan comes in and tells me to shut up. <laughs> Talking about the optic nerves. Yes. Can they be generated at all? Unlikely. I've not heard of that, unfortunately. How about the mobility? Say your left leg. You know, I would have said. Um, Unlikely that whatever recovery somebody's going to get is fairly soon. But you know, people keep trying new things. And who knows? I mean, I saw some report on TV or something like that, and this is not particularly my <coughs> area, um, about people with, um, what, did, what did this girl have? some kind of neurological problem with the peripheral nerves, which is really not my area. And uh, she took up scuba diving. And she started to have some objectively noted increase in sensation and increase in movement. 
Why? Who knows? Breathing the air under high pressure, maybe? Who knows? Is this a fluke? Is this repeatable? Who knows? Uh, and on the other hand, like I talk about prosthetic devices for memory, for getting lost, for going to school, you know, they're doing some really neat things in terms of prosthetics for people walking and moving now. And they're starting to wire them into your body. And they've got some really fancy stuff now. And, you know, maybe there's more bang for the buck in something like that uh, than, the, than the recovery. And it all depends on the person. It all depends on frustration, what you tolerate, all these other things. Yes, sir. I uh, had a brain tumor in 1997, a lot of And I retired about a year later. When Working mm -hmm. part time, my wife said, "Why don't you do something?" Mm -hmm. I started with tile floor. Uh huh. So I started with a bathroom, with a sewing press. I moved it along to uh -huh. you know, a living room, a bedroom, and then I decided to do a wall. Uh huh. I never had done a vertical uh, in the uh -huh. house, but the four inch square. Uh huh. I in the bathroom. Notice that the line is like a sixteenth of an inch gap. Uh huh. When I was finished, my lines were more like an eighth of an inch uh -huh. wide. Straggling and look like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the floors were fine. The floors were fine. Uh -huh. This is after a few few years of doing his work. Yeah. It turned out I had another brain tumor. Oh, no. Wow. And I was yeah. operated on again. Uh huh. And months later, and every time I go down my bathroom, I look at that wall. I couldn't figure out why. And then I remember when you tile, you use a trowel that's mm -hmm. made of rubber, about a quarter inch thick, mm -hmm. and you spread the grout. Mm -hmm. You get as much off as you can, and then you get a thick sponge, mm -hmm. and wet it, and you go over the joints, mm -hmm. and that's how you get rid of the excess. Mm -hmm. I forgot that step. Uh -huh. Completely forgot it. Uh -huh. Didn't remember it for months mm -hmm. after wow. the surgery, which was like a couple of years after the work. Mm -hmm. wow. So when you talk about recovery, it was just... Talk about yeah. physical manifestation. Yeah. It was just an incredible... Just yeah. I couldn't remember that happened anyway. Yeah. And I mean, this was after yeah. working for a few yeah. years. Yeah. So it's not a one-shot deal. Yeah. Um, something I forgot. Yeah. Thanks for Okay, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay.